Dr. Leonel Luis, who is a, a friend, he's an outstanding neurotologist, and he, he's uh, the head of the department of the Livo Hospital in the beautiful Portugal. Welcome, Luis. Thank you. Leonel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes? Good. Yes. Good. So I will need to put this there. So play slideshow. Can you see the the, the slide? Uh, no, you will have Not to yet. click on the share screen and zoom. Okay. So share screen. Good. And there. Okay, so this will be a very, hopefully, simple presentation on the head impulse test and video head impulse test. Um, so let's start with physiology uh, and let's talk a little bit about rotational VOR, although it's a topic and a subject that uh, is uh, very frequent. Uh, yesterday you had already talks and even today you had already talks on the head impulse test uh, since it's a, a very, very useful test uh, at the clinical and also at a research level. So, this is a video that I like to show, uh, which is a, a NASA scientist uh, holding an owl. And as you can see, it looks like uh, the bird is able to stabilize the head in space while the scientist move the, moves the body. And one could think that actually the bird is using vision uh, in order to be able to stabilize the head in space. But in truth, what it's using is the vestibular information something that you can see here quite clearly after covering the bird's eyes. As you can see, no matter the direction, the speed uh, uh, of the movement, the bird is able to do this. Well, we as humans are unable to do so, but we're able to stabilize the eyes uh, in respect to a target. Uh, and this is exactly the purpose of the vestibular ocular reflex. So uh, uh, what we know is exactly that, uh, uh, let me see if I can turn this off here. Okay, it's better. We know that head rotations uh, generate compensatory eye movements uh, of exactly equal magnitude, but opposite direction. The main objective of this reflex is exactly to stabilize the visual input during head motion. And we do move the head quite frequently, even when performing saccades. We usually make eye and head movements together. So it's important to maintain, to maintain the uh, visual target in the fovea. Let's see, okay. So, what we can see here is exactly that. So if we move the head to the right, so if we change the head position in space, let's say by about 40 degrees to the left, the eyes must move at the exact same magnitude, but to the opposite side, to the right. So 40 degrees to the right, and at about the same uh, time. So, uh, Sorry for this. So uh, uh, with almost no latency, we know that the latency of the VOR is about six up to 11 milliseconds. So it's a very, very fast reflex. This reflex enables the eye position in space not to change during uh, uh, the head movement. As you can see, the eyes uh, maintain its position in space during uh, the head movement. We can plot it not according to uh, position, but according to velocity. And we have exactly the same thing here in black, the eye movement and in gray, the head movement. As you can see, when the head moves, and this is milliseconds, when the head moves and changes its velocity to a peak velocity and then again to nil, the eyes actually uh, uh, reflect the same velocity profile during the exact same time. 
So in both velocity or position, what we want is exactly to stabilize vision during the, the, the head movement. And this is something that uh, we can see here. Let me see if I did that, perfect. This is exactly something that I tried to present here. So uh, we're stopped, we're looking at the target. If we move the head to one side, the eye has to move to the other side in order to be looking at the target. What's important is that the magnitude of the movement has to be exactly the same, let's say 40 degrees of head movement to 40 degrees of eye movement, so that the eyes are kept in the target. If the VOR gain, if the VOR reflex is non-compensatory, then the eyes will move with the head and at the end of the impulse will be not looking at the target but rather off target and a compensatory movement will have to be uh, uh, elicited in order to uh, uh, look at the target again. So, good. So this is a resident in our unit, he's actually a specialist now. And um, uh, you'll see that uh, we'll try to perform the head impulse test on him. He has a normal uh, head impulse test. So the basic physiological principle in this is that uh, uh, at start uh, and at rest, you have the same uh, vestibular tone on both sides. So it's quite balanced. When you turn your head to, let's say, the right, what you do is that you momentarily increase the vestibular tone on the right side, the side to which you're rotating the head to, while inhibiting the vestibular tone on the contralateral side. This generates an asymmetry in brainstem, like we just heard uh, uh, about, and this asymmetry triggers an eye movement that is exactly the vestibular ocular reflex movement. So the eyes will move to the opposite side. The eyes will move to the lower vestibular tone side and with the exact same uh, magnitude as the head movement that was triggered. This will result in eyes not changing its position in space. And this is what we see. The eyes move to one side, is still looking at the camera, and even with slow speed, this is 25% speed camera, you can see that he's always looking at the camera. That is, the vestibular ocular reflex is compensatory during the whole time when the head uh, starts moving up until the end. Good. So, when we have a lesion, let's say on the left side, if we turn the head to this side, an asymmetry will still be produced, but it will not be compensatory. What does this mean? It means that, uh, again, the vestibular tone is uh, uh, at rest, is balanced between the two sides. When I turn the head to the left, the left will not detect or it will not detect efficiently that the head was turned into that side. While on the contralateral side, it will still be able to inhibit the vestibular tone. So an asymmetry is always elicited if we have a vestibular function, uh, namely on the contralateral side, but the magnitude of that reflex will not be compensatory. It will be of a smaller magnitude than the head movement that it was produced. This will result in the eyes not staying uh, uh, in place, uh, uh, in, in the same uh, place in, in space, but rather moving with the head, something like this. So the vestibular ocular reflex should be in the direction of the lower vestibular tone side, okay? But because the vestibular ocular reflex is not effective, the eyes move with the head 
and as the patient was instructed to look at the camera, you will need to trigger a saccade in order to refixate the target, something like this. There you go. It's exactly the identification of this saccade here marked in yellow that allows us to say that the head impulse test is pathological. But as you can see, uh, uh, the deficient VOR, which actually has the same direction of the saccade, was the reason why the saccade was elicited, because the patient was no longer looking at the target. This is a video with a patient with a lesion on the left, and as I hope you can see, to the right, the patient is able to look at the target, while with movements to the left, it's unable to do so. There you go and the saccade has to be elicited. I know that it's not easy to see videos with Zoom. Uh, we cannot see exactly the same thing as online, but I hope you can see this. Okay, at this time, are there any questions? Because this is really, really, really important. If there are questions, please interrupt me and uh, do it, <laughs> ask. We can repeat this. Okay, since there are no questions, let's move on. So, if I would plot this head impulse test that we're uh, looking, uh, the video on the left, uh, as a velocity uh, profile, you will see that during impulses to the right, this is the head velocity profile for the head, and this is also to the head during left impulses and during right impulses. And this is the eye movement profile. As you can see, during right impulses, the velocity profile of the eye has the exact same magnitude as the head velocity profile. It's symmetrical. While during left impulses, the eye velocity profile is not compensatory. It has a less magnitude than the head velocity profile. The eye to be of exact same magnitude should perform something like this, correct? Okay, another thing that we can see is that because the uh, velocity profile is of lesser magnitude, at the end of the impulse, a saccade has to be triggered. And it's a huge peak velocity saccade, something that it's very easy to see because it will produce a massive amplitude saccade. Also, the latency is quite late at around 300 milliseconds after head impulse start. So for our human eyes, it's very easy to see a movement with such a high latency. But note that no matter, uh, 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 while we can, we can identify this, this, this saccades here, we are unable to identify these, although they also have a very high peak velocity of uh, nearly the same uh, magnitude as this ones. But we cannot identify those because they have a very short latency. These are the so-called covert saccades that are triggered with the head impulse. And these are, are the overt saccades that are triggered after the head impulse end. These are covert also because they are not easy to see with naked eyes. And these are overt because they are easier uh, uh, to identify with naked eyes is exactly the identification of these overt saccades that uh, uh, actually enables us as clinicians to say that the head impulse test is pathologic. Still, as you can see, a video head impulse test plotting gives you so much more information, even before you are quantifying your data, something that we're not doing uh, uh, one impulse that it's also pathologic that you go 
if you can identify again i know of the video prompts uh, uh, being uh, uh, to, to see these videos online. But now with slow motion, you can see that the head impulse test is pathologic to the left side. I can show it again, let's see. The patient, as you can see, has a right beating, spontaneous nystagmus, and he has a left pathologic head impulse test. Okay, so it makes sense. It's a, a, a left acute vestibular lesion. Here you have a, a, a one kid exactly with the same thing, uh, also an acute vestibular lesion. He's pointing at the camera with his little finger and you'll see first with 100% velocity uh, a camera and then with slow motion camera, you will see uh, uh, where uh, uh, the lesion is. Difficult, and now slow motion, much easier. So again, left lesion, and then a saccade towards the right. I will repeat this video. As you can see, with 100% velocity, it's difficult, but with slow motion, something that you can do with a smartphone nowadays, it's so much easier to identify the side of the lesion, especially in patients with acute spontaneous nystagmus. So, as you can see, although the head impulse test is a clinical test of unquestionable utility, and this is why you guys see it over and over again in every conference, in every seminar, everyone is talking about it. The truth is that it has shown to have a rather low sensitivity of about 63% and specificity about 78% in detecting unilateral vestibular lesions. And why? Well, because it's not a quantified method. You're just looking at the identification of the ovid saccades. And as you, can, as you just saw, it's, it's about so much more than just the ovid saccades. So it's a very important test to have uh, for bedside testing, but it has a rather low sensitivity and slightly higher specificity in detecting unilateral vestibular lesions. Here, for instance, another patient. Let's see if you guys can see, if you can consider it as normal or abnormal. It's really not easy. I can tell you that this is a patient with case three, so with Machado Joseph's disease. She has a deficient bilateral, uh, 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 she has a deficient uh, VOR bilaterally. And as you can see with the video, we could almost say that it's uh, 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 normal. So, uh, 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 although it is sometimes difficult to uh, 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 diagnose bilateral vestibular lesions with the head impulse test, in my center, uh, we reached uh, slightly higher sensitivities and specificities, uh, uh, a sensitivity of about 80%, which is much better than the, the sensitivity for uh, unilaterals, and a high specificity of about 92%. So again, very important test, not quantified, but very, very important test worldwide in every, every clinical department. So let's move on to the technology. So what is the advantage of the VHIT? Well, the advantage of the VHIT is exactly the quantification of the head impulse test. Uh, it allows you to uh, uh, perform the head impulse test both uh, uh, at the horizontal level and also in the uh, vertical planes, and you can do it different ways. There are different ways to generate vertical impulses. Here, for instance, along the LARP, so left anterior and now right posterior or just using the two hands on top of the head. It's more unstable, but again, you can do it also. You can also rotate the head in order to uh, reduce the, the torsional component of the head impulse test, putting the eye a little bit eccentric. But again, it's just a matter of technique. 
So what are the uh, quantifications that we can do? The first one, which is very important, namely for neurologists, is latency. This on the right is a patient with a free brush ataxia and on the left, a patient with a case And as you can see, in both cases, you would clearly say that the head steps is pathologic. Let's move on to the Machado, Joseph's patient. But you could not say much, much more. You can see that both patients are ataxic, of course. They have a lot of uh, uh, other eye movements uh, uh, disorders like we just saw. But uh, uh, just using the head impulse test, could, could we say more? Could we, for instance, analyze latency or exactly quantify gain? No, we could not. And actually, you have here the video head impulse test for the first patient on the left, the pre-dextra taxi patient, and here the patient with the case three. As you can see, the gain, the magnitude of the uh, uh, ocular movement with the head impulse is basically the same. The gain is not much different, but the latency is. It takes much longer for the free direction taxi patient to uh, uh, deliver the eye movement as for the case three, although the gain is basically the same with over two cards after. And actually this is something that is uh, important because you can control and you can diagnose, uh, 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 you can differentiate, better saying, the Friedrich ataxia patient in a group of, uh, sorry, in a group of uh, uh, this neurodegenerative disorders, uh, uh, just by looking at the VOR latency, which is much more increased in free direction taxi patients than case three, case ones, or case twos, or namely controls. So this is the first thing that you could look at. But of course, the most important thing, and that it's actually uh, uh, out of the shelf with the solutions that are sold in our days, it's about gain and quick eye movement. Regarding gain the quantification of this low phase of exactly this eye movement here in regard to the head movement. What can we uh, uh, calculate? Well, the gain is basically the ratio of eye movement to head movement. And it's, very, it's really important when you read the paper or you listen to a presentation that you understand what, what kind of gain that is being referred to. The most classical way to calculate gain, and this is the way that we use to calculate it for scleral search coils, for instance, it's instantaneous gain. So you say, let's say at 60 milliseconds after head impulse start, that the head velocity was 150 degrees per second, you see what was at the exact same time, 60 milliseconds after head impulse start, what was the eye velocity? And it's 150 and 130. So 130, the ratio 130 to 150, that yields a gain of 90%, a gain of 0 0.9. Okay, in the same subject, if you calculate the gain, not at 60 milliseconds, but at 80 milliseconds uh, after head impulse start, you see that actually now in the same patient, the gain is one, 180 to 180. So it really depends on the way and uh, the time where you're calculating your gain. We could calculate it, for instance, at peak velocity, for instance, or 20 milliseconds before peak velocity. Okay, so this is instantaneous gain, this is velocity. Okay, so if in order to, to be able to calculate this gain at a given point, and here you can see the instantaneous gain change during time, as you can see, it's always around one. There is a little bit of, uh, it's noisier uh, to start with, but then it's very, very stable. There is another way to calculate it, and that is to relate the eye velocity to the head velocity. And it should be a linear function. That is, every time the head uh, is moving at 100 degrees per second, there should be only one eye velocity that relates it to. 
And this is why you have a line. If the results are scattered like you have here, that means that for a hundred degrees per second velocity, you could have 90 degrees per second I velocity or 100 or 120 or 130. So the information this gives to you is that actually the results are noisy. There is noise here. And usually noise in these results means that actually there is slippage. The camera uh, uh, is not stable in uh, uh, its position relative to the eye. And as you can imagine, if you have a camera that's looking to the eye, it will not know if the, the, the eye moves or the camera moves, which uh, part moved. It will not know if it was the camera or the eye that moved. So this is very typical for slippage. As you can see here, if you look at instantaneous gain change during time, it's no longer stable. It's very unstable. So if you have this kind of results, namely because of the equipment that you're using, because you already know that there is very slippage involved, namely because the patient does not tolerate you putting the video head impulse test very tight in the head. Uh, so any reason because the patient is Asian and the video head impulse test device is very unstable around the nose, uh, some uh, uh, of this may justify uh, uh, another approach, that is not to calculate the head impulse test uh, gain, the video head impulse test gain around this area, since it's very unstable. So for these cases, it's better to calculate not a velocity gain, an instantaneous gain, but rather a position gain. So we'll try to know how much was the head amplitude, how much was the eye amplitude, and then calculate the ratio. Let's see if for a 40 degree head movement, if we actually had around 40 degrees of eye movement. So a position gain, something like this. What was the position of the eye and the position of the head? We know that position is, of course, also not optimal. And why? Because we know that after around 100, degree, uh, 100 milliseconds, there are other systems already contributing to the eye movement, namely the cervical or ocular reflex that is mainly important when you already have a lesion, namely optokinetics, namely uh, eye following, smooth pursuit. So there are other systems contributing. And if you really want to know what is the vestibular function, then it's better to try to uh, have better uh, uh, recordings and calculate instantaneous gain. If you really cannot do it, then move on to position gain, especially if your equipment allows you to calculate all these uh, uh, gain uh, calculations. Okay, then you have refixation saccades that Nicolas Paris is going to talk about, but don't forget you have the coverts and you have the overt saccades. And why is this, uh, uh, and why am I referring this uh, uh, saccades? Well, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. This is a patient with a free dextrotaxia with the saccadic intrusions, with this ocular flutter that actually, when you run a head impulse test, can be seen something like this. So as you can see, a saccade with one direction, a saccade with other direction. This is not a covert saccade, okay? This is actually the result of a saccadic intrusion that was triggered with the head impulse start. So it's very important to be able to identify which one are uh, refixating saccades, uh, because of a deficient uh, 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 vestibular ocular reflex or uh, saccadic intrusions like this uh, 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 ocular flutter that you can see here in this free dressure taxi patient. Also, the important of this is because you calculate gain in order to know if the vestibular function is normal or abnormal. And abnormal vestibular ocular reflex can be uh, because of an hypofunction or because of an hyperfunction. 
if you have a NIPO function, if you have a gain that is uh, below normality range, then it must present with uh, 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 refixating saccades. You cannot have a deficient gain that actually at the end of the impulse, the patient is looking at the target. That cannot be. So if the vestibular ocular reflex is not compensatory, the saccade will be triggered. So there is this arrangement of deficient gain with compensatory saccade, with the same direction, of course, of the vestibular ocular reflex. What is the gain cutoff? The gain cutoff, again, depends on what is the calculation method, okay? So it's very important for you to not use uh, uh, um, uh, a gain range without knowing what kind of gain calculation you're using. Do not use an instantaneous gain uh, range at 60 milliseconds if you're calculating actually position gains. So the best thing is probably just to calculate your normality data. That's a very good way of knowing your device, getting used to it, learning the technique. So uh, after you reach that, gather uh, uh, some, some, some subjects, normal subjects, and gather your normality data, okay? This, for instance, is the normality data for my lab. Very important, look at the asymmetry rate between sides, about 3%. So we consider it normal in our lab up to 7% percent difference between sides. Now think about what you consider uh, normal when you're using calorics uh, uh, as a way to evaluate vestibular function. So about 22, 23%, right? So regarding vestibular hypofunction, again, the same thing. And I've been asked this, this, this question so many times that I think it's important for you to consider this. Uh, if you have a vestibular uh, a function that looks hyperfunctioning like this one, so again, we would say of about 1.3 or 1.4, with no saccades, it's probably just a technical error. You should repeat uh, uh, your, your testing uh, and your calibration. But look here, you have an hyperfunction, so if you have an hyperfunction at the end of the impulse, you're not only compensating for the head movement, but actually even further away. So you will have to trigger a saccade back to the target. So a saccade with the opposite direction of the vestibular ocular reflex uh, um, that you can see here. So impulse to the right, I moves to the left, but too further to the left, so it has to come back to the right. This combination of hyperfunction uh, in the slow phase and a refixating saccade with the opposite direction is clearly uh, a, a case with a real hyperfunction. Now imagine that you have something like this and with a saccade with the same direction. It wouldn't make any sense you would be looking even further away from the target. So probably a technical error. So here you can see exactly a gain of about 1.3, a gain of about 1.34, and again, saccades with the opposite direction of the slow phase. So these are cerebral patients. Like you can see here in this video, Saccades that have the direction, there you go. Saccades that have the direction, there you go. Have the direction of the head movement. Saccades that have the direction of the head movement. Saccades that have the direction of the head movement. Again, so these head impulse tests are pathologic, but the saccades have the direction of the head movement. Very, very important. Okay, so very important, look for artifacts. Just don't use, and I've received again and again and again plottings of head impulses from around the world asking me, uh, how do you interpret this? And I interpret most of them as noise, 
So really bad uh, video head impulse test plottings. So don't try to over interpret uh, uh, plottings that are just not right. Try to achieve something like this to start with. So very neat, very nice video head impulse tests with an instantaneous gain at around one. Very, very stable. Look Hello. for the stability of the goggles on the subject's nose and try to avoid slippage, okay? Because like I said before, these cameras, they mistake the camera slippage for eye rotation. If Hello. this happens, if you're touching goggles or if you're moving the soft tissue beneath, then try to calibrate again, try to attach the camera better, okay? This is very, very, very important. And don't Excuse forget, me, if you had in post test, yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, actually, we need to expedite as uh, uh, we're running behind schedule by almost 20 minutes. Uh, okay. Yes. So sure. you can use the video head impulse test, but uh, in bilateral vestibular patients, in acute, very importantly, in patients with recurrent, probably not importantly for positional vertigo, but very important before ear surgery very easy test that you can use before ear surgery. And that's it. Thank you so much. Sorry for that uh, uh, delay, but I, I cannot have during Zoom, I cannot have here any clock. I cannot hear anyone now. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Hi, yeah, but, but I had no video. Anyway, um, yesterday we had a very interesting, nice talk. Congratulations. Uh, you are... Now you can see me. Um, okay. Yesterday we had a, a, a nice uh, talk about the latency. So, what's mm -hmm. the importance for this audience? <clears throat> of latency in uh, B heat. In, in what clinical condition do you think that is usable? Well, actually, we could first start thinking that it's only important for uh, uh, neurology patients, neurological patients, but it's, it's, it's not true. It has been shown uh, uh, also for peripheral patients that there is a latency shift in patients with uh, peripheral disease. Um, so everything that uh, affects uh, starting the, the AIDS nerve will have a, a, an impact on latency. Still, uh, I think that, uh, like I showed, namely in patients with MS, in patients with uh, uh, Friedreich ataxia, uh, you can see this, and it's important that you look at it. It's very difficult to, um, avoid noise and slippage. Uh, uh, you probably do not uh, saw this because it was so fast and only a slide. But when you calculate the latency with the V-hit, slippage is uh, so much present that actually latency is negative. So there is a slippage effect when you calculate it. So it's not the best way to calculate latency for sure, but in relative terms, uh, uh, in uh, some of the neurogenerative conditions that you know that there will be a latency shift, it's, it's important. It could direct, uh, namely, genetic diagnosis. Uh, yesterday, the discussion was about that the latency is more prolonged in patients with bilateral <clears throat> vestibular failure without oxylopsia. Did you get it? Well, yeah, I, I, I did not listen to it. I, I, it let's see, a patient you know, without oscillopsia. I want, patient with, uh, I want a patient with bilateral failure. Yeah, yeah. You a patient have, with BVL but without oscillopsia. And we know without that. that. <clears throat> yes. So a patient where uh, uh, actually the uh, uh, velocity of uh, a fovea movement. Uh, uh, is not too big, where you can actually still uh, not notice the slippage, let's say. 
the same thing that happens with uh, that very well-known graph uh, uh, from Z and Lee uh, showing the, the, the velocity of the nystagmus and uh, the, the, uh, actually the, the um, uh, loss of uh, uh, visual acuity, visual acuity uh, and, and uh, nystagmus velocity. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that is exactly the case. I know that the latency is important in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, movement of the image in, in the fovea, of course, and it's important in terms of uh, calculating the, the gain. If you have an eye movement that is actually uh, off axis of the head movement, mm -hmm. if you calculate the amplitude, if you calculate the position gain, it could be actually around one. But if, if it's really, really delayed, then at a given point, you will lose uh, visual acuity. So that could be the reason for that. But I, I, I really cannot tell. Uh, there is a question. <clears throat> uh, can, you, can you read the chat? Yes, I can look at it. Okay, from Jesus. Very nice, thank you. From Francisco, what is your opinion about normal gain but with clear compensatory cigars? Good, so this is exactly what I was saying. The only reason why you generate the saccade is if at the end of the impulse, you're not looking at the target, let's say enough. There is a, a margin where you can look at and uh, the, the image is kept in the fovea so that you, do, you do not generate saccades. If you need to generate the saccade, that means that the head impulse test was not compensatory. And not being compensatory means uh, uh, especially uh, uh, the eye movement. Eye movement magnitude by velocity and position. There is no other reason to refixate. You would never, you would never refixate with uh, it's not the correct way to say it, but almost as an anti saccade looking off the target, it, it does, it's not physiologic. If you're generating saccades, it means that the head impulse test is not completely compensatory. And of course, the magnitude of the saccades depend. That's obvious. It can be a very high amplitude saccade if you're really, really off target, or a smaller amplitude saccade if you're closer to, to the target. But um, as, as, as someone already said, uh, 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 a compensatory uh, uh, head impulse test would uh, uh, only happen if you'd have a gain of one and a latency of zero. And then both head and eye would actually uh, uh, run online. And it's interesting that actually that is exactly what happens. After a, a short latency, and let's say about 20, 30 milliseconds after head impulse start, there is prediction involved and I and head, they run online. So, but this is another thing. 